machine a flat across the face of the plate. Less than the width of the blade. That's good enough. Here is the plate that we've just machined. I, you can see the steps in it. It's quite straightforward and simple. And here in my small furnace I'm cooking the ball bearings. They've been held at that sort of temperature now for about an hour. And I'm now going to switch off and allow it to cool down slowly. This will enable me to drill them with ease. If you haven't got a furnace, um, you can always put the balls in a, in a piece of tube or a tin can, chuck it in the fire, and when you rake the ashes out in the morning, it should uh, have done the same job. Here I have drilled and tapped for 5 sixteenths thumb screws. And here I have made two pieces, that way, with three projections. That way it will always stay steady, with a clearance hole larger than the thumb screws. This is the completed jig. It needn't be any more complicated than this. Here I have a piece of uh, hacksaw blade, as I haven't any uh, bandsaw blade uh, material to demonstrate with, but this will serve the purpose. Wherever the break of the band bandsaw blade is, square the end on a grindstone. Like so. And then at an angle, Put a bevel on the, on the blade. That should be enough, I'll turn that down. And there we can see we've got a bevel on the end of the blade. Do the same on the other end of the bandsaw lengths, but on the opposite side of the blade, so that when they come together, we'll have a, a greater surface contact area for the brazing. Now that we have our blade uh, set up in the jig, it's perfectly flat and the backs of the blade are up against the ridge that we milled into the plate. This gives us a flat and straight butt joint and the, the scarfs overlap one another and there's no ridge there whatsoever. But we've increased the, the joint area. Uh, we can now proceed to uh, Silver solder this with, with a small propane uh, torch, but I'm rather fortunate here I have oxyacetylene, so I'm going to run um, some bronze over the joint. So with my bronze, bronze stick, I'll, I'll heat the end up, pop in some flux, some will melt to the end of the rod, and then this will be applied to the joint with a flame, uh, a neutral flame by the way, um, do the same when this is cooled on the opposite side. This is why we've cut the window in our piece of uh, plate. And then when completely cooled down, take out the clamps, take it out of the, the, uh, the, uh, the jig, and grind away the surplus bronze. Um, so it's virtually smooth here again. What we want is a smooth transition through the, the bandsaw guides. And here's our completed bandsaw blade. Some people have difficulty folding them up, but it's quite simple. Take two opposite ends, bend them together, cross over, and you'll end up with three coils. 
place a piece of wire around the soft wire, copper wire. Hey presto, one bandsaw blade when you need it. Now that the ball bearing has been let down and I've cleaned it up, I've drilled an eighth hole through the centre. And as you can see here, I've, I've put in a piece of, of eighth stainless rod with a point at each end. This is an interference fit um, and the distance from the centre of the ball to the short end point is about an inch and a half and the distance from the centre of the ball to the other point at the other end is about four and a half inches. So this gives us a magnification factor of about four. Here we have the completed uh, centre finder. Needs a little explanation I think. Our, our ball bearing is captive between two pieces of metal uh, that's hole drilled in, so it's smaller than the ball bearing, obviously, and countersunk, and then held together with some set screws. And it's a universal joint. It'll move in every possible axis except the longitudinal one. And this needs to be made uh, of a size that will go into the tool post of your lathe. Now we come to the modus operandi. Uh, having marked our material and centre popped it where we want an accurate hole, as you can see I've mounted the, the centre finder in the tool post and advanced the small end into the centre mark that we've made on our material. This is set up in a four jaw chuck. And if I rotate the chuck by hand, you can see an exaggerated error at the opposite end of the waggler. If we now adjust the jaws of the four jaw chuck, so there's no discernible movement at this end, then we will have lined up the material on the exact axis of the lathe, so that we can now proceed to drill an accurate hole. So we replace the, uh, the lathe centre uh, with a chuck and a drill and we should end up with a hole in the right shop. OK, a quick word about looking after old machines. I've had this old culture student for many years it's done an awful lot of work. And I think the manufacturers and craftsmen that built this put a lot of care in what they were doing. And I think it's upon me to look after it. Um, best way to keep machine tools in good condition is to use them. Um, nothing's worse than something that remains stationary for years. Um, I'm very fortunate I don't suffer from condensation in the workshop. I have a wood burning stove that gives a nice dry heat. But when I clean them down, and they do need cleaning down from time to time, I, I've got a, a, a spray uh, canister. I think it was originally furniture polish or something. And I fill it up about three quarters full with diesel oil. And then I fill the remainder with a light machine oil and then give it a good old shake and I use this to squirt over the machine and wipe it down with a rag. Um, 
Ideally you should use a soluble oil. It will take longer to contaminate uh, your suds reservoir if you use uh, soluble oil. Um, if you have an aversion to diesel oil, sensitive skin, what have you, well then use a barrier cream, but it's never bothered me. Um, I think what tends to happen is the oil gets worn off or evaporates and it leaves a very slight sort of film, the oil can't possibly evaporate, over the surface and keeps it in reasonable condition. And considering this lathe is getting as old as me, um, it really pays to look after them. Cutting polystyrene foam with a hot wire cutter is very easy. You can cut in any direction, any shape you like. If you're packing up unusual shaped parcels, this is the way to protect them in the post. Duplicate items, cut it in half. And it's just simply a piece of hot wire. Well, how does it work? Well, there's nothing to it. Absolutely nothing to it. Let's pan back. It's nothing more than a box. A light dimmer, a piece of stainless steel wire tensioned with elastic bands, and the light dimmer is on the primary of a small transformer. About 6.3 volts heater transformer, 3 or 4 amps maybe. More than adequate. Right, there's no limit to the thickness. There's no limit to the thickness you can cut. Oh, switch it on would help, silly Billy. So if you have lots of parcels to send off, and I occasionally send some items on eBay, and you get some joker that says, it was broken in the post, and he wants his money back. Really? Well, none of my items get broken in the post. I encase them solidly in polystyrene. A little item you can make in an hour, hour and a half. Nothing to it. Cost you five a maximum. Well worth making.